Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. Uh, the title of this webinar is The Investment Outlook for Environmental Funds in a Co Post-COVID World. My name is Senka Piskulic, and I am co-chair of the Environmental Funds Working Group for the Conservation Finance Alliance, as well as currently presiding REDLAC, which is the Latin American Network of Environmental Funds. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, just a few words on our working group, on the Environmental Funds Working Group. The mission of this, of this working group is to promote knowledge transfer and exchanges about environmental funds among relevant funds, donors, and NGOs. We have um, over 122 members from 33 countries, and we focus on issues such as governance, asset management, and innovative financing. As you all know, environmental funds are behind many of the conservation efforts and the accomplishments of the global conservation goals. So currently, the Environmental Funds Working Group is focusing on raising awareness and disseminating updated information on environmental funds. Um, looking forward to the international fora to raise the profile of, our, of environmental funds and putting them as key actors in meeting the 2030 vision. Um, this we hope to achieve through advocacy, participation in many of these international events, and communicating the results of the 10-year study and the practice standards, which are currently being um, produced by the by conservation finance. Um, also, REDLAC, which I am also proud to preside, is a community of environmental fund, and we seek to strengthen our members' capacity to be effective fund managers and leaders in innovative financial mechanisms for conservation and sustainable development. Um, just a quick note, um, from October 6th through 8th this year, Together with CAFE, which is the African Consortium of Funds for the Environment, we will be organizing a virtual Congress to address financial sustainability, investment, fundraising, and other relevant subjects related to conservation finance. So we will be sending you more information um, on this virtual Congress. So stay tuned on our social media for information about registration to this event. So we, we are very proud to be hosting this webinar today and hope that we can all learn together about the role of environmental funds and the investment outlook for the post-COVID world. So first I would like to um, give the word to Eleanor um, from the Nature Conservancy so she can also give a short introduction before we get started. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Zenka, and pleasure to be here today to join Zenka in welcoming you to this webinar on um, investment outlook for environmental funds in the post-COVID world. The Nature Conservancy Caribbean Division is pleased to be listed as a co-sponsor of this event, along with CFA and REDLAC. But I first must give recognition to the genesis of this webinar. This undertaking was uh, Robbie Bovino's brainchild, and before his departure from TNC, Robbie worked with REDLAC and CFA, as well as with the investment advisors to organize this webinar. So we want to thank Robbie for, for his hard work on that. Um, for the Conservancy, this webinar is also important because we have been a part of the establishment of many uh, conservation trust funds around Latin America and Caribbean region. And in this, this basic cur current situation, we have been working with REDLAC and CFA to host this webinar to give trust funds more tools to have a better understanding of the present situation and future trends with regards to, to their investments. This is also important for me in my role as vice chair and treasurer of the CBF, the Caribbean Biodiversity Fund, and chair of the finance committee for the Caribbean Biodiversity Fund. As I'm sure you can all appreciate the importance of keeping abreast of all investment markets following trends and always being open to receiving sound advice from experts. So with that, I, I will hand back over to Zenk. I wanted to keep it short, say good morning to everybody. Welcome and um, hope you, you enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. So off to you, Katie, so we can get started. Katie will be moderating this event and will also give us a few recommendations and tips as we move forward with this webinar. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Zanka, and thank you, Eleanor, and um, welcome to everyone. We're thrilled to have you here. Um, the format for today's webinar is that each of our three panelists will speak for about eight to ten minutes. Um, on the specific topic of what um, what is going on with the markets right now and what can we anticipate uh, coming forward going forward and and really also what can um, the fiduciaries of conservation trust funds and those investment assets um, be doing right now in a time of, of volatility and uncertainty so after the panelists speak we'll have time for a question and answer 
Um, everybody will be muted. So if you joined, you were muted and your video was turned off, please, if you can keep it that way, it helps to prevent background noise. Um, if you have a question for the panelists, please type it into the chat box, which you should be able to find at the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen. And when we get to the Q&A portion, we'll either ask you to unmute yourself and ask your question yourself, or we can read it for you if, um, if you prefer. So I want to thank our three panelists for joining us, Andy Peek, Christian Turi, and Juan Edinger. All three of them have extensive experience working globally on investment management. Um, working specifically with endowments and foundations and working with conservation trust funds. So they bring a wealth of, of expertise and knowledge, not just of what um, investors in general are needing to think about at these times, but specifically what conservation trust funds and environmental funds are um, facing right now. So thank you to all three of you for joining us. We're thrilled to have you here. Um, the first presenter will be Andrew Peake, um, from, is, who is a managing director from UBS International based in New York. Um, Andy works primarily in private wealth management, specializing in managed investment portfolios for high net worth, high net worth clients and institutions. He's got a regional focus that includes China, Europe, Latin America, and the United States. So Andy, thank you for joining us and let me hand it over to you to, um, to speak. Okay. Thank you very much, Katie, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, look forward to a, a good discussion during these very difficult and complicated times that we're, we're working through. Uh, I, I put on the front page, which Kumar has up, uh, sort of a, a somewhat complicated explanation of what we're going through, and I thought the complexity of the explanation sort of was similar to what the world that we're in today. So the onset of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic incubus dramatically has reshaped the definition of conventional economic equilibrium, challenging and stretching our imaginations. In this inextricably interconnected world of global economic activity, with de minimis interest rates, investors need to ratchet down expectations while bracing for increased volatility. And I think that's the main theme of my, my remarks today is that Investors need to ratchet down expectations and increase volatility during this period of time. Uh, Kumar, if you can go to the next page. So I, I only have four slides and I'll, I'll go through them uh, uh, with, with a little bit of detail, but ratcheting down expectations in this environment is necessary because we're operating in a world where interest rates are at zero or negative. You know, what will the near-term outlook B vis-a-vis -vis the economic recovery? Is it going to be V-shaped, U-shaped, W, flatline, Nike swoosh, hockey stick, square root? All of those things could be true. We just don't know given this unprecedented period of time. Uh, in Europe and Japan, obviously negative rates dominate the investment landscape. And for the moment, thankfully, uh, inflation is not a big worry. Uh, on the left side, if you look at the upper, the upper bold points, Austria, uh, two weeks ago issued a second 100-year bond at a yield of 0.88%. The first one was done in 2017 at a yield of 2.117%. So we're in a new world where interest rates are obviously driving, where our normal drivers of returns for our safe assets. And in this environment, I think things have changed dramatically. We've seen unprecedented monetary and fiscal bazookas, which are now commonplace that the authorities are using to try and offset uh, a COVID-19 induced economic collapse. Uh, and if you look at the left-hand chart in the middle, that's the Fed balance sheet at about $7 trillion. Um, and it looks like the Fed balance sheet will continue to rise, uh, probably peaking at something like $10 trillion. Uh, the, the, another, another major point in this environment that we're in is global debt has dramatically increased since the financial crisis, and global debt now is $258 trillion, or about 331% of global GDP. So the overall weight of the debt market is weighing on investors as investors search for return, and the fixed income markets don't offer much in, in the terms of returns. Uh, I think Technology will continue to disrupt almost every aspect of our lives and businesses. Uh, and we obviously have seen the divisive uh, politics in countries around the world that have really created an acrimonious path for 
politics, whether it's the U.S.-China issue or whether the Europeans, uh, which yesterday did a good job in gathering their new plan. Uh, another thing that's enormously important in this, in this environment is climate change is real uh, and in need of immediate attention in all dimensions of society. And how that is going to play out in the investment world, I, I think, still is to be determined. But for the moment, that's something that's on investors' mind as GSE investing is obviously gaining in popularity. Uh, the final point on this page is uh, tax codes are going to need to be redesigned to raise revenue to pay down all this debt uh, that the governments have taken on as the wealth gap continues to grow, which creates, obviously, a lot of tension in society that we're seeing around the world. Uh, Kumar, next page, please. So, so just thinking about portfolios in this environment, uh, I think you know, and I've been a, I've been in the business for about 30 years now, and the traditional 60/40 stock bond model, the balanced portfolio, has been uh, sort of a tried and true way of achieving good returns over a period of time. But I think in this environment, the lower return environment, higher volatility, and less income. I think portfolio managers, including conservation funds, are going to need to rethink how they uh, do their investments. So I think if you think about the goals, uh, the philanthropic goals of the organization or the fund, they're going to need to sort of start with that, ratchet down expectations, and then say, how do we redesign the portfolio? I think the core portfolio will still remain a combination of high quality U.S. equities, international equities, all of the traditional tools that we use in our toolbox. And I think that the use of fixed income in general, investment grade fixed income, where US Treasury bills are trading at 15 basis points and you have uh, the 10 year Treasury trading at 65 basis points, I think that will become less important in portfolios over time. So I think the way in which endowment funds and conservations can really gain the returns that they need in order to continue with their project is they're going to have to move more and more towards alternatives. And alternatives are obviously a different asset class. They're more complicated, they're more expensive. But I think that's something where all conservation funds are going to have to be thinking more about investing in hedge funds, whether it's long, short, relative value, multi-strat, whatever. Private equity, which obviously uh, uses leverage and has a much longer time horizon, but should offer higher returns over a longer period of time. Venture capital, which is obviously much more risky than the established uh, public markets. And then things like structured notes for yield enhancement and things. But I think the key thing in this overall situation is the endowments and the trustees of the endowments need to really understand before they invest in these newer type uh, securities. Uh, the portfolio is going to be very different than it was 10 years ago because we have other issues to take a look at in terms of the overall cost, the leverage embedded, the illiquidity risk, which is something that we need to keep in mind, uh, the definition of risk, right? The definition of risk in March 23rd of this year is very different than their definition of risk sitting here today in July. What different sort of payout profiles do we need in order to achieve the projects and objectives of the conservation fund? So I think this is sort of the new world for uh, conservation endowments where they're going to have to think a little bit more broadly and that the old 60-40 portfolios do not do the job in this sort of environment. Uh, Kumar, next page, please. I just thought I'd include uh, just talking about expected returns uh, at UBS. Every couple of years, we put up our capital market assumptions. And uh, the right-hand side shows the February 2019 assumptions for our returns for over a cycle and then over a multi-cycle period. And then in April 2020, we redid our numbers. And if you look at the difference between the two on the left and the right, uh, you'll notice that the fixed income numbers have gone down dramatically. Uh, U.S. investment grade fixed income expected returns over the next, call it three to five years, is 40 basis points, right? Municipal fixed income, which has been tried and true for most wealthy Americans, has gone to 40 basis points. And these changes are something that we have to incorporate into our portfolios, uh, particularly when it comes to risk, because 
eliminating fixed income or reducing fixed income considerably will obviously mean taking on risk in other asset classes. Uh, if you go to the next page, it basically just shows a summary uh, of the two, uh, the changes between the February 2019 and the April 2020 numbers. Uh, Kumar, next page, please. So this, you can see the difference and you see the changes, particularly for the fixed income side of the equation. And I think this is something that we all need to keep in mind is fixed income, you know, buying a 10 year treasury at 65 basis points uh, has enormous risk embedded in it. And that we need to think about other ways of generating income for our conservation projects. So those were the thoughts I wanted to start with. And uh, I guess Katie will throw it over to the next speaker. Great, Amy, thank you. <clears throat> Pardon me, thank you so much. That was wonderful. And I'm looking forward to the Q&A portion of the discussion. So our next speaker is Christian Turry, who is the Chief Investment Officer and Managing Director at FINAD GmbH in Vienna. Uh, FINAD is a multifamily office. So the practitioners there are generalists with a very in-depth understanding of a wide range of financial operations. And because they're based in Europe, he can specifically also bring the European investment perspective. Yeah. So with that, Kristen, let me turn it over to you. Thank you. Sure. And Kamari, I think you may need to share, share, uh, make sure his mic. Just, just, I'm not sure. Okay. Okay, Kum Kumar, can you handle it? Sorry. <laughs> or is it us? I'm not sure. No problem. Uh, I can handle it. I can it. do it. I can do it. Can you see it or? Yeah, I'm currently sharing your presentation. So just. Uh, you just do it already. You, you do yeah. it already. Okay, great. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, we would like to start with the next slide. So, yeah, we, we just um, learned um, the, the current situation, what it is. Uh, we just uh, wanted not to be redundant and tr to repeat. So we just sum it up what we have heard or what we see as a big picture. I think what was very important um, for the uh, most uh, recent developments uh, the last month that we uh, saw a syst system shaking crisis which has been avoided um, and the markets are stable at the cost of never before seen liquidity injections. Uh, that means countries and central banks had been very active. Um, the key question is because of this divergence between the equity market which rebounded uh, substantially uh, in the last uh, three uh, months um, and the, the real economy uh, data uh, which uh, still still weak and um, uh, this this divergence has to be closed in the in the coming months and quarters so um, market conditions so liquidity conditions uh, tend to outweigh fundamentals over the short term, meaning that the, um, that the very good performance of the equity markets could continue uh, in the next uh, weeks and, and months before we see uh, a fundamental change in the, in the macro data. Um, what we already learned uh, is that the uh, equity markets absolute valuations of equity markets imply for returns far below average that we cannot expect the historical returns of the uh, asset classes we experienced uh, before the crisis. Uh, volatility will still be uh, elevated. Um, what, what could bring some uh, confidence still into the equity market is that uh, investors are not positioned in equities uh, that uh, strong. We saw a more a retail uh, investors coming into the markets, especially equity markets, but not the professionals, uh, which are still at the sidelines. 
um, we experienced some net outflows from, from equity ETFs uh, still. Uh, on the region, on the regions, uh, uh, Europe is, is managing the healthcare crisis uh, better uh, than the US, for example. Uh, we had this uh, EU uh, stimulus yesterday, uh, which was very uh, welcomed by the markets and showed that the valuation gap between Europe and the US could narrow in the future. Um, European equities underperformed substantially in the last years and that could be also closed this gap when the money uh, com comes to work from, um, uh, from, the, uh, from the fiscal stimulus in the, in the European Union. Next page. Um, we, we share the, the asset allocation. Uh, we learned that 4060 is not uh, uh, maybe the, the solution for the future. Uh, for, the, for the time being, uh, what have we done in our asset allocation to give an example for our uh, clients, our uh, conservation trusts here uh, in Europe? Uh, we uh, we stuck to the equity allocation of about 40-41 percent uh, also in the crisis. Uh, we did not reduce the uh, the equity allocation um, so we came out of this uh, uh, crisis uh, well. Um, there is a diversification in other asset classes like alternative investments and especially precious metals uh, and very low weighting in the fixed income area, as we already have learned with uh, low yield expectations and relatively high uh, volatility. Uh, next page. What have we learned from this crisis um, with our clients? Um, we think uh, in, in terms of an outlook that risky assets, risk assets uh, could be the place to be still. Uh, it could be a good year also 2021 for, for risk assets because of these uh, historical uh, laggings, the increase in money supply impacts risk assets with a lag and infrastructure stimulus should come through some time next year. So that will kick in uh, the high liquidity uh, which was provided by uh, states and central banks. Expected returns in global equities, including emerging markets, uh, 18 months forward about 10%, but we see also volatility in this um, uh, asset class of about 15% drawdown uh, on the way uh, to this uh, return. Um, yeah, Europe, as we already has mentioned, uh, has potential to catch up because of better crisis management. So that could mean that there is uh, inflow into this area. Uh, we can see it also on the improving um, uh, Euro uh, versus the US dollar and also versus the Swiss uh, franc. Key learnings, uh, what was very important for us, um, because of these tail risks, hatch your portfolio when you can, not when you feel you must. Um, we had experienced by the beginning of the year that insurance was really cheap. Nobody was thinking about uh, in insuring uh, portfolios, especially equity portfolios. Uh, but uh, for, the, for the future, I think it's very important to keep a kind of tail risk hatch. Um, what we have also seen is that market liquidity, market def, uh, depth uh, disappears quickly um, and that uh, relentless selling could kick in uh, immediately. Uh, especially volatility went up sharply uh, and volatilities, volatility index above 25 uh, means that very large moves can, can happen at any time. Uh, our portfolio, which we have already shown, we think tech and gold as a kind of bubble portfolio could make sense for the next uh, 12 to 18 months. 
uh, that means um, that uh, the liquidity and low rates will continue to boost tech stocks as a long duration quality play in 2021, hurt the US dollar and lift gold as a store of value, uh, especially in terms of negative real yields, uh, which we are experiencing. Um, and we think that inflation risk uh, is a little bit underestimated at the moment and uh, that could be a perfect hedge also to upcoming uh, inflation risk. So big tech US and China, long euro and gold uh, would be our, our recommendation uh, in terms of portfolio allocation. Next and last slide. Uh, what we have also seen and what we are recommending is um, ESG, which becomes much more important, not only for, uh, for the trusts we are uh, advising. Uh, we think that ESG is becoming more important um, for equities and all other asset classes. Uh, I think in the, in the second quarter, inflows into ESG ETFs uh, increased substantially, uh, whereas the outflows of the normal uh, ETFs, equity ETFs, uh, was seen. So uh, we, we call it sustainable capitalism, uh, a combination of sustainable investments and uh, efficient investment. Uh, we have uh, an example here in Europe recently experienced ESG filters would have prevented an investment in Wirecard, the Enron of Germany. How is it? Well, it's, um, it's here a scandal here. I think it's all, all, also known to, uh, to other investors around the world. Uh, we think the G in ESG governance uh, would have helped prevent it, uh, this default case because the equity prices dropped from one day to the other about 98%. Uh, we have here a summary of um, uh, recent um, uh, research. Uh, ESG reduces cost of capital, demonstrates long-term thinking, improves corporate culture and brand value operational risk and tail risk mitigation. Um, on the right hand side, we have uh, three uh, citations, uh, which uh, uh, we think uh, are important. Uh, good performance on material sustainability issues signific significantly outperform firms with poor performance. Um, issues with the highest ESG scores tend to have the lowest CDS spreads and the bottom quintile of ESG stocks experience large drawdowns three times more than the top quintile. So we think uh, uh, taking into consideration ESG could uh, improve the performance of, uh, of a portfolio, especially uh, of an equity uh, portfolio. Um, thank you very much. For, for the time and I uh, give over to the next speaker. Kristen, thank you so much. That was great. Um, let me um, introduce Juan and then um, we will definitely um, have, I think, a robust Q&A opportunity. So Juan Ettinger is the Managing Director and Global Head of Institutional Portfolio Solutions for JP Morgan based in New York. Um, that group focuses on designing and managing single and multi-asset portfolios for endowments, foundations, and institutional families. So thank you, and let me turn it over to Juan. Thank you, Katie, and uh, <clears throat> good morning, everyone, and good afternoon for those in Europe. Um, I'm going to spend 10 minutes going through a series of, uh, of charts. Um, please stick with me. I, on, on the other end, I have like 20 of those, so plenty of pictures to watch. I'll try to uh, keep, it, uh, keep it fast. Um, first comment, just a recap of what we just lived through, okay? Um, you can see this is the Manufacturing Services Index. Uh, it, it was operating above 50 in the majority of the economies before the pandemic. 
it collapsed to zero. That means the, the world went to a stall, okay? And <clears throat> we are seeing, <clears throat> excuse me, signs of recovery, and we'll get into more of that in a few seconds. Now, there's something pretty unique about this recession. This is a supplied recession. It's not a demand recession. Essentially, people didn't have access to services and products because essentially the economies were shut down. And what is unique about supply recessions is that they tend to come back pretty quickly, the recovery compared to demand recessions. As a data point, look at motor vehicle sales in China. Look at the dip and the subsequent recovery is pretty fast. So that is on the back of everything bad that we're living is something that keeps us our spirits higher than if this was a traditional demand recession. Now, <clears throat> what happened in, um, in a supply recession? Well, who comes in to, to, um, to jump to maintain essentially macroeconomic activity is the government, right? When consumer investments, imports, and exports, those who re remember their macroeconomic studies, uh, retrace, then is the G of government who comes in. So we have seen phenomenal amount of stimuli, um, injections, okay, liquidity from governments all across the world. In some cases, as much as 10, 20, 30 percent of the GDP of those countries. Okay, so it's the containment requires pause, right? And, and, and it's the stimuli who breaches the gap. Now, what happens in markets? Um, valuations collapse. You can see this is price earnings ratio over the last 25 years. And you can see that before the pandemic, we were operating slightly above the historical averages of price earnings. And what happens in the pandemic is collapse in March and then aggressively bounced. This is a little concerning. We are today at around 20, 21 times earnings in valuations. That is about the same we were in the, uh, in the years of the internet bubble. So unless earnings recover to justify those prices, then this is some area to, 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 to keep an eye on. Expect a lot of volatility ahead. Um, about COVID. So the good news about COVID is um, the curves are getting flatter with the exception of LATAM and a significant number of states in the United States. Okay. So um, it's more likely, in our opinion, that new measures are not going to be about full lockdowns or shelters in place like we see in March, April, and May, but more precise and selective, like closing certain sectors of the economy, like bars, indoor dining, um, requiring, requirements of wearing masks, etc. But the overall picture is one of the stabilization. Um, here's the picture in the United States. So you can see the two tails. Half of the country went through the first wave, and then we have half of the country really going through um, the, 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 second, the, the, fir the first wave now. Um, the bar to reimpose lockdown is very high. So we, we expect policymakers more in line to require selective measures. Um, topics we are seeing relevant to conservation funds today. Government, governance and how investment decisions are made. Uh, March and April were a little bit a deja vu to what happened in the global financial crisis. Investment committees made of voluntary members who have full-time jobs in the face of a 30% drawdown happening very fast cannot find in, found themselves not prepared to react quickly. And those, um, those uh, who operate more uh, closer to their financial intermediaries banks, asset managers, consultants, had a faster reaction time. Um, the use of alternatives besides stocks and bonds, just like one of my partners mentioned, global views versus local views. Um, risk management is here to stay. 
think that we will have in the future likely fiscal deficits, inflation, okay? Um, those are going, and we have zero yields in, in, in bonds, so they don't provide protection. So risk management is very important. And obviously sustainable investment, which we don't think is just uh, uh, something hip for the moment, but it's a trend here to stay. Um, three themes in investments. New economy, we just went through 10 years of technology adoption happening in just a couple of quarters, okay? So um, the entire technology complex from communications to media, to software as a service, to cybersecurity, data management, um, it's here to stay, we think is a wave of productivity that is not just for a few months, but is longer term. So investments in technology are core to our portfolios and innovation in general. It's not just technology, it's innovation. It's companies that heavily invest in research and development. Second, what I mentioned, tail events. Here to stay, there will be more of them uh, and it's hard to protect from these tail events because they are unknown unknowns. So a basket approach to that through asset allocation, diversification, cash, gold, fixed income and correlated assets is key. And obviously sustainability, about half of the stock of professionally managed funds, about $30 trillion today, are ESG in, ESG in their investment process. Um, so we think this is here to stay. Now, let me make a few comments about this topic with some charts. Um, look at the top chart here. Um, electric vehicles versus all vehicle sales, software versus other types of capital expenditures, e-commerce versus physical retail. This is where we see pockets of growth, the new economy, okay? Um, look at technology spend in cloud, okay? Healthcare investments and gene, gene therapy approval. So healthcare and technology, key themes in our portfolios. What is going to happen with fiscal monetary stimuli? Is it going to the base currencies? Who's going to be winners and losers? Uh, we went through two cycles of currency here. You see from 2000 to 2012, massive dollar depreciation. We saw from 2012 to now, massive dollar appreciation. So what is next? This so far plays pretty tight to the typical playbook that currency cycles last seven to 10 years. If this holds, we should expect a dollar depreciation cycle ahead. Um, on sustainability, what COVID proved uh, when, when level of activity uh, collapse across economies is that only 20% of the world cities are prepared to provide an environment of living uh, that meets environmental standards. The air quality is, um, is poor in 80% of the metropolis. And if you combine that with aggressive policies to cut uh, carbon emissions by US, Europe, and the green is China, then you have a macroeconomic situation and a policy support to provide input to alternative energy, for example. So you have here the cost of alternative energy collapsing significantly in wind, uh, in, in natural gas, in renewables. So we expect over the next 20 years, um, renewables to be not just 20% of, of 20, 25% of the stock of the of the power generation, but closer to 50%. So this seems long-term, but it's already happening today. Look at electric vehicles, okay? This is global electric vehicle sales forecasts, okay? Booming, annual sales by market, okay? Adoption rates in Europe, okay? So we are seeing already many money managers, private equity funds, um, and it's happening already in public markets like Tesla, um, adoption of alternative energy to support business models. Um, now a few last, 
last comments to, to leave you with, um, to give some context about this pandemic. This, um, this market event is not unique. Um, we have seen a number of the last 30 years, for different reasons, create volatility in the market, just as what we went through. Now, there's something um, I want to share, which is a list of known unknowns. Okay, so um, those are excellent reasons to either go to cash or not invest. Okay, and generally paralyze investors. And this is the returns that each of these known unknowns were followed with. Okay, significant returns to those investors who don't get emotional, maintain a discipline and a process, okay? While some have significant short-term effects, the market has always found a way to, to recover from this. Obviously, the pandemic is up close and personal in nature, um, so has the potential to affect investment sentiment much more, but, but these two shall pass, okay? Um, it would be hard to bet against a medical solution from, from, um, from against everything we know about medicine, technology, and, and human ingenuity. Now, diversification matters. Uh, look at the last crisis. Uh, the stock index took from the trough of March 2009 all the way to March 2012, three years to recover, okay? But a diversified portfolio, in some cases, took only six months, okay? So, and when the, when the cycle ends, okay, a diversified portfolio and just the pure market ended up almost in the same point, okay? So why not take the kids roller coaster rather than adult roller coaster? Um, finally, home bias. Be aware of your biases, very tricky. Um, you know that Australians, invest 72% of their money in Australia. But Australia is only 2% of the global stock market. This is like going to the supermarket and only buying in one of the aisles. Okay, you wouldn't do that. You would want to have the access to the entire supermarket. And, and that home bias happens consistently. Colombians like Colombia, Australians like Australia, Japanese like Japan, etc. So beware of your proximity bias. Another one is volatility is normal. This year, in perspective, from a market's perspective, wasn't different from many, many, many other years. We saw 34% peak to trough, okay? Year to day, we're 4% as of June 30. We're close to flat now. So if we were just to look at the numbers, no much difference. A um, Couple of final thoughts. Um, stay invested. If you try to ex try to pretend to be smarter than the market or having an edge, very dangerous. If you miss the best 10 days of the last um, 20 years, your portfolio collapses in the S&P from close to 6% to close to 2% just by missing the best 10 days. And generally the best 10 days happen right after the worst 10 days. So even more dangerous is trying to to time the market around around these um, these uh, these events, um, don't be emotional. Don't don't be emotional. Be logical, and um, and be aware of hurt following, especially in bubbles or in drawdowns. Final slide: time and diversification is your friend. Okay, in one year intervals, a stock market can be as good as 6% or as bad as 41%, but see what happens when your window of measurement expands from one year to five years or even to 10 years. Your outcomes start to get narrower, okay? And your expectations are closely met. Uh, even more, when you start diversifying, not just one asset class into multiple asset classes, okay? Alternatives, fixed income, credit, currencies, commodities, uh, then the opportunity to diversify um, plays into in, 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 in to help you. So um, that that's all I had. Um,
Katie, I'll make just a, a last comment about social investing. Huge growth, okay? We have seen double digit growth in all markets. Um, performance of sustainable investing is not lagging traditional investing. And um, whether it's exclusionary, integration, thematic, or impact, the amount of assets we're seeing in the industry um, going into this, um, this segment is just, is even surprising everyone inside institutional workforce that has been planning for this, but it's even more surprising than we expect. Uh, Katie, back to you now. Great, thank you so much, Juan, and to all three of you, thank you for, um, uh, for your thoughts and for the perspectives that you shared. I would like to open it up to questions. So if anybody has a question that you'd like to pose to the panelists, please put it into the chat box um, while we are waiting for those to pop up because I have a few questions as well. Let me, um, let me first put this to all three of you. Um, there were several suggestions that the traditional 60-40, um, uh, first of all, that the 60-40 um, equity fixed income portfolio would be more stable and more diversified over time, more likely to be resilient. But, um, but also a push from, um, from at least two of you that moving into um, or being more focused on alternatives would be more um, likely to generate returns in the, um, in the immediate term coming up. But conservation trust funds have historically and traditionally been um, heavily weighted towards fixed income and more, um, perhaps more risk averse in that sense that the volatility from the equity markets um, has been uh, daunting. So what, um, if I'm on an investment committee and I'm anxious about the volatility of the equity markets, what's the message that you would give to encourage um, that leap into moving away from the stable, if low, the stable returns of fixed income into taking on more volatility? Andy, I think you're speaking, but you're muted. Sorry, I'll, I'll take a stab if you like. Uh, I, th I think a couple of things, if you think about fixed income right now with the 10-year treasury at 65 basis points, you could argue that the 10-year treasury has more risk than an equity or an alternative. Uh, the only reason you'd buy a 65 basis point 10-year treasury is if you thought rates were going down uh, possibly or rates were gonna stay at these level and never go up. So I think you could argue, and a lot of people miss the fact that you know, the Barclays aggregate, which is the usual fixed income benchmark, as interest rates have come down, the duration of that benchmark has gone up dramatically. It's gone from about five and a half, six years up to eight years, and that means your fixed income, obviously risk has gone up. I think secondly, um, and I think you know, Juan and Christian both pointed out, you know, technology is a place where you wanna be thinking about investments because technology is gonna to continue to change the world. And, you're really not going to get any uh, technology investments by investing in fixed income. And so you have to look for other ways through which you can invest in technology. And, and I think finally, trustees are going to have to sit down and say, if we have a 5% spend rate today, is that realistic in an interest rate environment where the 30-year treasury is at 1.3%? And so other sources of income or other sources of donations may need to be leaned upon during these leaner income years uh, as opposed to previous years. You know, if you have a 6% money market, life feels a lot different than when you have a 0% money market. Great, thank you. Uh, Juan. Katie, I was, I was uh, if I am a conservation fund, grant making committee or the executive director of the investment committee, I'm thinking that I can finance my budget with three things. Um, pledges of donations. Um, I can uh, create revenue type projects. I can generate investments from my portfolio. And all of that goes into a spending budget or a spending rate. Those four things have to be in equilibrium. So. I think there has to be a reset into the expectation of the entire conservation fund community 
that to make those four things in equilibrium, there has to be adjustments. Not, and, and because the, the capital markets are expected to deliver less, okay, then spending rates will have to come down, okay? Then, as, as Andrew was saying, the fundraising machine has to move up, okay? And, and alternative ways of creating revenue from, you know, conservation, tourist, sustainable project has to be taken into account too. So uh, long loss are the times where, you know, as he said, treasury yields were 6% and equity markets were just clipping 8% every year systematically. It's going to be very hard going forward. Great, thank you. Okay, may something adds to especially Andrew's remarks um, on um, uh, fixed income. So sovereign bonds, we think, uh, yeah, very risky, uh, yields are low, um, but you can find some, some ideas in, in um, fixed income like COCOs so, um, or in, in CLOs, uh, which had been hammered in the, in the last uh, or in the, in the beginning of the COVID crisis. So to pick up risk in this area, but not in the sovereign area. I think that could make sense. And my last remark to the ESG, sustainable, what we have um, uh, uh, seen um, on the ESG side, it could make sense in alternative in investments to, uh, to invest long short equities, for example, with the factor ESG, environmental, sustainable and governments uh, uh, issues. And you can also uh, get a nice dividend out of that. So in addition to the uh, traditional asset allocation, uh, there are some asset classes uh, where you can find s uh, stable uh, cash flows so that you get the distribution and the dividend you need in a trust uh, to continue with your projects. Thank you. Um, there is a question um, from Pablo in the chat box. Pablo, do you want to unmute and ask your question yourself? Yes, I just wanted to ask Juan Ettinger about what his view was uh, regarding sustainable finance instruments, uh, specifically bonds and equity in the Latin market. Uh, in the near future, and in particular after Argentina restructure his uh, its external debt. Thanks. Thanks. Yes, uh, what we are seeing, the investment community of whether it's individuals, family offices, endowments, foundations, pensions, they're buying less of individual issues like green bonds or particular companies, and they're buying more programs like mutual funds, ETFs, private equity funds, hedge funds that have an investment process that includes uh, ESG or exclusions. So the, the industry develops significantly in, um, in, in, in these products. Now you can build an entire portfolio that is ESG compliant and is rated by MSCI or any other information provider. You can create a fixed income portfolio and exclude certain sectors or issuers. But what I'm not seeing as much in volume is funding particular issues of a green bond here or, or, or a revenue bond there, okay? But I'm seeing, um, I'm seeing, and I believe I had one, um, one slide that shows, uh, give me one second. Uh, well, for example, now every, um, every security now is rated according to uh, ESG quality quality scores, right? Um, you have you have an information system like MSCI providing this, 
So investors are more comfortable understanding what they are buying. But again, what we're seeing is more flows into mutual funds, ETFs, private funds than to specific issuers. Uh, investors don't have yet the means to decide to buy one specific bond versus buying a commingled program. Great, thank you. Um, I suspect we could keep talking about this for a while, but I wanna be conscious of the time as it's coming up on the hour um, and thank all three of our panelists for your participation today. This has been great. I think it's been informative. I think it's been the start of a conversation that I imagine will continue um, throughout the rest of the year and, and ongoing. So I look forward to, um, to continued situations where we'll be able to continue to have these, these discussions. Um, thank you to Redlack and to TNC for your sponsorship along with um, the Environmental Funds Working Group of the CFA. Um, the last thing I want to point people to if, um, Kumar, could you put the last slide up? Um, the Conservation Trust Investment Survey has a new resource page on the CFA website that's a, a new landing page for uh, investment topics related to conservation trust funds. You can see the, um, it's uh, conservationfinancealliance.org slash CTIF. So please do visit that page for investment resources um, we have, we're posting articles as we get them. So we're also open to suggestions for additional content to put on that page. Um, all of the past issues of the CPIF are there. And um, this webinar will also be available through the CFA website as well. So um, if anybody missed it or you um, wanna revisit something that you didn't catch the first time, please uh, catch the, uh, the replay. Thank you to everybody, and um, we look forward to hopefully seeing you at our next webinar. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.